Hey everyone, welcome to our first Zoom podcast series, where Amy and I talk to Vic and Dan, who are the co-presidents of iGEM Toronto this year in 2020. And so what we talk about is the whole iGEM leadership experience from their point of view, and how it helps them become better scientists. We also talk about some topics such as how iGEM experiences help students become better researchers, how does it compare to academic research positions, and we learn more about how they cope with the stresses of, of leading an entire iGEM team. So without further ado, I present to you our first Zoom podcast series. So this is a question that we've asked all the iGEM teams, and we want to ask you guys as well so to, to kind of give context to, the, to our listeners. Um, um, from each of your perspectives, um, how did your iGEM story start? All right, I'll go first. Um, so in the spring of 2019, I got an email from the Cell and Systems Biology Coordinator um, saying, oh, there's this thing called iGEM that people do in the summer and the deadline is tomorrow. <laughs> so I sent in an application, um, not really understanding what the organization was, kind of just like a shot in the dark. Um, then I got an email from from Jack Costelli saying that they want to have me in for an interview. At this point, I still don't even know what iGEM is. I just saw that it's like for genetic students. <laughs> so I figured before I go in for my interview, it might be a good idea to look up what it is. And then I realized I'm actually super into it. And it's actually uh, a super lovely organization that has a lot of positive aspects. That, and I ended up choosing it over, um, over canonical summer research. Um, and I was wet lab lead last year in Toronto and then moved to co-president this year with Victoria. And I guess the rest is history. Um, so I guess it's sort of in, in contrast to Dan, but along the same lines, uh, back in 2017, I was working in the metabolomic engineering laboratory and I was really obsessed with the notion of CRISPR. So I was, I just really wanted to find a group of students on campus that would let me do the experiments I wanted to do. Um, so I found um, iGEM Toronto after some Googling. It seemed like a really cool um, opportunity. Like it was like, I liked the notion that it was interdisciplinary. There was like the computational team and a wet lab team and like the human practices team, of course. Um, so I applied to the, to the, uh, wet lab lead position then in 2017 and that sort of like started this whole journey and I realized that it was a really a really really unique community and that's kind of kept me coming back for more I guess the one thing about that story that's kind of interesting is I was originally rejected from the position because Adele sent me the wrong email so <laughs> had she not corrected her mistake I would be at a very very different position in my life at the present moment so you know I guess the, the importance of the hiring process to iGEM is definitely <laughs> Definitely cute. You said you're still on the CRISPR hype, right? Oh, pardon, sorry. Would you say you're still on the CRISPR hype train? Oh, absolutely. Uh, one hundred percent. I think like it's one of the, it's one of the most amazing technologies that humans have ever discovered, and it allows us to make changes to genomes that otherwise would be impossible. So yeah, I think it like revolutionizes our like relationship to other organisms on Earth, and it underscores the importance of fundamental research because the tool would have never arisen had we not been interested in how bacteriophages affect other things. And also, like, it came from, like, it, it was kind of similar to an iGEM problem in the sense that, like, um, Horvath and the people at the DuPont factory in which it was discovered were really just trying to solve, like, a basic problem, like, okay, how do we prevent our cultures from being attacked by bacteriophages? But in the process of trying to just, like, solve that basic sort of, like, engineering challenge, they discovered this really basic fundamental bi biology. And I think that's part of also why, like, iGEM continues to interest me, because you are solving real-world problems, but you learn really interesting things along the way. So would you say you've jumped on, like, other hype trains at this point? Because CRISPR was what you started on, but obviously over the years we've done different projects, so have you jumped on other hype trains at all? I mean, the present hype train that I'm on is like solving plastic degradation with microbes. So <laughs> I, no, I feel like my my interests just align with whatever the iGEM project is. I, I'm sure I'll hop on another hype train soon. TNU has kind of got me into protein design, to be perfectly honest with you. So, yeah. 
And so Dan, like, uh, what about you? Have you had your interests, like, has your interest changed in terms of where you thought you were going to now based on your experience at all? Or like, has the exposure just taught you something different that maybe you didn't really, you know, know about oh, yourself absolutely. at all? Um, so prior to iGEM, I was just another med school hopeful, which, I mean, you can associate a plethora of archetypes to that. Um, and I did have like, I did have leadership experience. I've been social at all. So it's not like I just signed up for iGEM because I wanted to put another notch on my belt and on my CV. Um, and I think what iGEM taught me due to the nature of it being so interdisciplinary and so, um, it was just so exciting. <laughs> it makes bio, like really synthetic biology and the way iGEM frames it makes industrial biotechnology like it, it really, it really highlights how exciting and interesting it is. So, if anything, um, as far as how iGEM has affected my future plans and my passions, it's really, it's really showed me how cool biology can be, even if it's not necessarily related to the healthcare field, right? So it's really awakened this passion in me to to make a difference in the world um, through through solving problems with biology um this whole plastic degradation problem that we've been working on um and just looking at all the other iGEM projects around the world is just so freaking cool and i never realized that the fundamental genetics research that most people are learning in their undergrads can really be extended into something so useful and applied um this is something i wanted to ask uh you guys especially in your undergrad programs, your life science programs, how much do they emphasize or encourage you to think about biology from a, like an engineering perspective or some kind of design perspective? Nothing. Like, <laughs> I didn't even know what the word synthetic biology were until I was acquainted with that, Jim. Yeah. yeah this I, is I, I also that, second that. Uh, I think it depends on the, the institute that you're in, too. Because Dan and I both come from molecular genetics and cells and systems biology programs, and I think that those are really, really emphasize, they really emphasize the fundamental research. So synthetic biology doesn't really fit under their domain, but they allude to it in like a few lectures. And it's the institution. U of T has, has an excellent engineer faculty, but the uh, arts and sciences faculty have never been one to really emphasize co-op programs or applied science. They really, U of T likes emphasizing the accumulation of knowledge. Um, but if you go into like even different campuses like U of T Scarborough and Mississauga that have these applied co-op programs probably emphasize it more, same with schools like Waterloo and whatnot that are known for their... So do you kind of like, based on your experience with IGEM and what you learned about, you know, having a lot of interdisciplinary based studies, do you feel like the university should be active in kind of changing their current academic um, in terms of their current academic ways and being a little more interdisciplinary or promoting that and like how would you want to ask the university to promote that and in what manner and so on? Um, I'd really like to speak to that. I think that the main thing is supporting it as a legitimate endeavor. Like the things that iGEM students are capable of accomplishing when they have proper support um, in the form of like PI mentorship, resources, all of these things, like we've been really grateful to have that in Biozone in the form of uh, reagents. But I think when you have like top tier scientists that are also um, providing that sort of like education and tools, it just enables all the iGEM projects to be better. And it, I think it also retains students and helps to like foster that interest further. So I think that it needs to be a part of like the university's goals, I think to also support um, applied research. Yeah, just to add on to that, I feel like um, many academic institutions are, are viewing the education of biology in not necessarily an outdated way, but an arguably selfish way, and that the programs are designed to teach us enough skills to pour back into the institution itself. Um, and once again, it's just entirely based on the faculty. Um, but I think it would be very, very useful if the university would pour more resources into um, just applied biology and applied genetics because the field is vast and a lot of graduates, a lot of people who have already started their, uh, 
their careers in biology do not realize how applicable it is to different situations. So one of the one of the things I've noted is that typically these biotech or more applied science courses in life science programs are are there are opportunities that students have in their fourth year or third year of their of their degree. And typically you don't learn about biological design in your first and second year. But when you look at engineering, for example, they do teach design concepts already in first year. And so part of me thinks that, you know, is there a way that we can redesign the life science curriculum for biochemistry or for molecular genetics such that you teach design concepts in first year? I don't know what you guys think. Can first year is do it in life sciences can they learn these you know synthetic biology concepts like genetic toggle switches um or gene editing for example as well um i definitely think that's possible in the sense that we like toggle switches again are covered in like one lecture in first year um and there's also like a couple of crispr workshops that were run for first and second years um through this this group called enable i think a few years ago so i definitely think that the tools um, can be learned by first years and there are some programs on campus actually that have um, second year research positions like the molecular genetics specialist program for example they offer a research term um, that you can work in a scientist laboratory but i think that if you're if you want to target students early and get them excited about synthetic biology and sort of involved in the applied research it would be really cool if um, basically they could do a term for igem or like working in in a lab in a synthetic biology context in those early years. Because I think, um, especially in your early years of university, you're really excited about the prospect of doing something that's meaningful and changes the world. And I think that um, like iGEM really supports that desire and that interest really well. So I think that, yeah, if there was some sort of formal research position, I think there would be tons of students that would love to go for that. Yeah, and even as far as integrating it into the curriculum, because I feel like the simple concepts of design and like like genetic circuitry and electrical circuitry and just like mathematical logic gates work <laughs> in a very very similar way and that's conceptually easy to understand for the average first second year university student i mean they've already proved in high school that they are capable of like the intellectual minimum to achieve like to understand these principles um and patrick i think it's interesting that you pointed out that it's really only taught in engineering and applied sciences programs and then it's almost like it's an option that we can learn um, when we hit upper years in our undergraduate degrees but since they never even uh, they never really emphasize the importance or the the opportunity to apply biological principles in design situations I think many people don't even understand how exciting the upper year courses are like there are very, there have been very very many courses offered at U of T that have completely changed my life as far as like experimental pipeline design and uh, biological construct design and whatnot. But it was because I got stuck with them. Um, so it's not necessarily because we are taught to be excited and to seek out these opportunities. So I think a lot of people that get involved in the IGEM community and synthetic biology do so by uh, by chance or by curiosity. Yeah, so I, I, I can already imagine some of the listeners being like, you know, the reason why they teach these applied courses later in the, in the program is because you need the fundamentals to learn about such advanced concepts, right? But there, like you said, there's still basic things like, like enthusiasm for the topic, awareness of the topic, and how far it goes, and other basic things like intuition for how to design biological systems, you know, central dogma, DNA, RNA, protein. I understand that with that, flow information, you can still modify it, but they don't tell you you can modify it early on, typically. Um, even telling students that early on is you know, useful. Uh, the one thing that I just wanted to add to that is I think um, there is a stage where you realize that our understanding of biology is a, a different mental models, right? Because like talking about biological systems as like something that you can engineer or like circuit design, that definitely comes from like a sort of computer science perspective. Um, whereas like I think the molecular genetics department where Dan and I were like kind of raised um, you're emphasizing obviously like the central dogma and like the way in which that information flow and transfer is manipulated at different levels with post-transcriptional and post-translational regulation so I think that on one hand like it's best to target students really early on get them excited about synthetic biology and they're eager to apply themselves but I also think that this needs to be balanced by the understanding that 
like there's multiple ways of viewing biological systems. And I, I almost wonder if it would be more useful to have sort of like a philosophy of biology class that's required for all undergraduates where they can see like which perspective they like to interrogate or they, they, they would like to research the best. Um, because I think that you don't realize until a little bit later in your degree that these are all just different lenses and frameworks of viewing biological problems. Um, so I think like that's, I think the reason why people get stuck in these like more fundamental research tracks rather than applied is because they're never shown that this is not just one way of viewing biology, but they're kind of told that this is biology. So that's what mm -hmm. I would have to I agree. Yeah, it's interesting. I, some of the people that excel in synthetic biology contexts are those who were raised in an engineering environment. Like even some of our iGEM members that are the, that give the most uh, creative and intuitive solutions to problems have been those who are raised in the context of problem solving. And I think it's it's important that synthetic biology is always in a team context, right? You you can't you're not going to have one person in a lab changing the world by modifying their DNA. Um, so I, I think there's an emphasis put on, like as Victoria said, that we were taught that this very much is biology. But at the end of the day, in order to, to be able to design a, a synthetic biological construct and to just exploit the central dogma to generate uh, proteins or DNA sequences, it's conceptually relatively easy to understand. You don't need to understand like the concept of pi stacking or Watson Crick non-canonical base pairing or whatnot. It's useful to have somebody on your team who could point out, hey, maybe this is going wrong because of this niche biological concept. But as far as you know, understanding, okay, DNA makes proteins, proteins can do things. If you put DNA in a microbe, it will make proteins for you. Like that's conceptually very, very simple to understand, even from a design perspective. So like in all of you guys talking about uh, you know, having um, the need to be uh, more abstract in the way in which you would think about, you know, going into, into biology or going to, into science, really, um, do you, like, this is more of an abstract question on that, on this end, but what do you think is kind of more important? having the knowledge, because fundamentals, you know, are super important to understanding anything. I mean, one plus one is two and you build from there. Um, or is it more of the experience? Because with the experience, you know, you can get the better understanding of a lot of other things that you may not actually get by just reading like a simple textbook or like hearing a lecture talk about something. So what are your opinions? Like, what do you think? Knowledge or experience? Like, got that balance. What do you think? I think experience makes knowledge easier. So right, while, while I understand that there very much is, I, I guess, a sort of dichotomy and one is important in certain contexts and the other is more important in other contexts. Um, if I were to choose whether I want the knowledge or the experience first, I would opt for experience just because to be able to have uh, hands-on and just experiential learning in general teaches the mind to think of things in completely abstract ways whereas often in a in a university setting biology is taught in a very linear and factual way and just some people's brains are like it's just the brain itself is difficult to comprehend abstract situations when you've been taught things in such a binary and absolute way that's why there's so many people who are flunking out on uh their third year experimental design courses because they haven't been even taught to think that way for two years of their degree and though they understand all the facts and they can spit out anything about genetic elements when they ask you to do a simple assay they just completely blank whereas anyone who's been in the lab for a month and a half could be like oh this is so simple if you look at courses like uft has a csb 349 course, which is often where students are, uh, they're, they're forced to answer experimental design questions for the first time in their undergraduate career. And the class average is almost like an invert, I don't remember the math word, but it's like the inverse Gaussian correlation where it's like you fail or you get 95 plus because these are the people that have been in a lab before and these are the people who are forced to answer lab questions without ever having touched any of the required materials. 
I think I agree with a lot of what Dan said, but I, the one point that I want to add is just that I think the two are not mutually exclusive. Like there's a sort of experiential knowledge that I think Dan is getting at in that particular example. Um, and um, I think that it's important that yes, you're inserted in a particular situation and you have to kind of solve problems on the fly. And that definitely um, makes you aware of things that you wouldn't otherwise think. Um, think of when you're just like dealing with like factual uh, information and like sort of storing that in a meaningful way but I think I guess what's unique about iGEM is that you you have to there's a sort of tension between the two concepts all the time and you need to balance those at in every single situation because on one hand you can go into a lab and carry out a procedure um, to solve some sort of experimental problem but then when you have variation in your results the things that you can't explain that necessarily returns to the fundamentals and the basics and like how exactly gene expression works in cells and why is it that these proteins are aggregating or being localized to certain things and like there's this mechanics to the cell that i think you have to understand at a really fundamental level in order to like extract the most out of that experience so i guess i would say that if i had to choose between the two like i would go with experience as dan said because that like <laughs> I think that just broadens your problem solving scope, but I think that it would be remiss to say that you can, you, you, it is one or the other at all times. No, absolutely. Like I, I like your, both of your point of views, I absolutely agree with. And like, I think, like I said, you can't have one with the other and the other also needs, you know, it's a paradoxical kind of sort of event. Um, but just because many people can have, the reason why I ask is because many people can have different views because something it's like chicken and the egg, in other words, say. Um, and I find that some people will focus a lot on knowledge because I feel like U of T, if you're going to talk about what these two, they uphold knowledge a lot. That's why a lot of, I feel like a lot of our science courses is just, here's a lot of information, they smack it in your face, and then that's what you, and that, that's all you get. But the only way you can actually learn how to apply those courses, um, or sorry, not courses, how to apply the knowledge is when you yourself reach out to those knowledgeable or to those experiences that you may or may not get. So lab, for example, co-op opportunities or internships, et cetera, et cetera. But in the university itself, they don't actually teach those notions. So it's interesting to see that people, I guess you two from, who are from iGEM and probably a lot of other members from our own teams and across Canada and even globally will have different ways of thinking about it. And it's just interesting that because of this one thing that is kind of associated with the university but still kind of non and still kind of separate is able to change these views despite a university who has been here for uh, how long has u of t been around for i don't even know anyways point is they've been around for a super super long time and they still don't get these kind of messages um so yeah just a very interesting kind of point of view but go ahead just one thing i wanted to say is i think the the greatest way that iGEM changed my perspective as like a second year, like moving into third year is that like the institution of a university is not actually designed to teach you to solve problems. Like, like it's there to provide an education, but like so much of that is actually self-driven. And I think that's something that is like, very difficult to realize like like a, a university provides content and it provides like very intelligent professors and like resources and things but like at the end of the day like you're kind of responsible for like shaping your own educational journey and i think that if there was greater emphasis um on these sort of like ex like opportunities outside you would get a better sense of like okay well how do i actually like contribute to the world as a citizen and this goes back to like a, like patrick illuminated this for me the first time when he gave his presentation about cs Burke and the sort of like um like like you, you learn in iGEM by learn by realizing how to become a better participant in the community, and it's a participatory style of learning. And I think that that's really what's missing from university because you're you're taught that there's these sort of hoops that you have to jump over, and like okay, I have to study this content to do well on this exam, and then but you in sort of like striving for that, you don't um, like there's that dimension missing that's like okay well how can how can how does this make me better as a as a graduate like as a candidate like what what is this you're not asking yourself that question always of like what, where does this take me next whereas i think that it's very clear in a like integrated learning setting like iGEM that like all of the things that you're acquiring and absorbing and learning in conversations with other people and as well as your own work is building towards something and i think that's like something that's definitely very useful and also missing from the, the the canonical university context 
it's funny how you could have knowledge without ever having experience, but being in a situation of experience forces you to accumulate knowledge and that if you're in a lab setting and something goes wrong, you're going to have to look it up. Like the concept of literature review is so foreign to the average university student because it's like, well, why do I need to review the literature? Everything I need to graduate is on the slides. But, you know, then you're in the lab and you're forced to use concepts from all four of your years, things you have never learned and things that you would have never learned unless you were encountered with a problem. So it's funny how um, it's almost like forcing somebody into an experiential situation will inevitably accumulate knowledge. So, okay, all four of us here have come from iGEM. Um, so Victoria, when you talked about the tension between knowledge and experiential learning, or rather even fundamental and applied sciences, um, you know, we're familiar with that tension now, but when we recruit new students onto the team, how do they deal with this tension? What, what have you found, uh, you know, leading these students? So it's interesting to see um, young students who have very little lab experience and people who have been working in lab to lab alike being exposed to the fact that you really have to cater towards your audience and that your audience, even in the context of iGEM is consistently changing. Because if you have a group of biologists in the room, you can use your niche biologist lingo and as soon as you throw an engineer into the mix you might have to change the way you are explaining it um so essentially it's just interesting to watch to watch people uh come in and ultimately have the same knowledge but based on their experience they are interpreting it in a different way and voicing it in a different way so what you're talking about circuit design, you sit down with an electrical engineer and you draw them a little diagram with the lines and whatnot that we learned in physics class. But when you sit down a biologist, you talk about it differently. When you're talking to somebody who has recently joined the human practices team, once again, it's you are forced to talk about it in a way that you would not even talk about it as a biologist. Um, but there's a little bit of um, a gap when somebody first joins the team and learns to kind of translate into and out of all these academic languages. Along with the concept of, um, I guess, bridging different jargons, one thing that Dan's comment kind of made me think of is like having different values. So I think that one way to, I guess, to teach new members like this way of thinking is to to explain that like iGEM is this like collaborative community, like like the value is teamwork, the value is like what you create together. Cause I find that like, like even I was thinking back to my myself in, in 2017 when I first joined iGEM, it really was to me like a, a like a sort of a competition. Like you you yourself were trying to demonstrate like your worth on the team and like your your ideas and your advancement were the most important, but over time, I, I guess, like, one of the things that it forced me to reflect on is that, no, it's actually, like, how, how you can support other people and also facilitate their learning and their growth, um, and it's not, so I, 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 this is all very poorly phrased, but I think um, it comes down to a value shift, and, like, I'm not quite sure how to communicate that value shift best, but I think that is, like, the key turning point for a lot of people into, like, transitioning from this sort of, like, in, like independent, like, traditional academic endeavor from like team-based work in iGEM. And so um, you both are kind of touching on this a little bit as you guys talk, but um, obviously you guys have changed a lot in terms of personal growth. You guys have changed a lot in when from before you started to now where you are currently, especially considering that you two are both holding co-president positions, A, <laughs> in iGEM Toronto. So more uh, along the side of like leadership and talking about this sort of topic or well that's kind of we're talking about the topic um is where do you guys think you are right now like can you give yourself a description of where your leadership development is currently at and like where you think you have to further grow or where you think you you still have a weakness that you have no idea how to solve but you got to get there at some point like can you guys elaborate on, on those kind of uh ideas Well, it's hard to comment on your own personal growth without sounding inherently self-deprecating or egotistical. 
<laughs> but I'll try my best. Um, I, I think when you're put into a leadership setting, like uh, even as an iGEM member, the first, like it's inherently, um, you kind of have to learn how to lead when you're not in a position of leadership, even as a member. And like teamwork is inherently a leadership quality. And then is you, if you kind of move up like the pseudo hierarchy towards lead positions, like wet lab, dry lab, human practices, lead positions, then you have to learn more and more management skills. Um, you have to learn how to teach. You have to learn a lot of patience. Um, so that was, that was a big learning curve for, I think, both of us in different contexts last summer. And what personally, as a, as a co-president, what I'm being faced with now that I didn't think, that I didn't have to think about last year is um, more like workflow organization. And just delegating, delegating tasks is a very, very difficult leadership concept I'm beginning to realize because um, people either have a tendency to micromanage and follow up consistently um, or people on like on the other side of the, on the other side of the spectrum, there are people who are overly trusting and nothing gets done. So I think that right now in my leadership journey, I am working on how best to motivate people to achieve the best work but also trust that they will because if if we as co-presidents are pouring into our leads and our members and if we are if we are giving them the necessary tasks or the necessary skills to accomplish the tasks that we're giving them that we don't have to worry about them not accomplishing it we just have to make sure that there's an atmosphere where they want to complete their tasks and they're feeling driven to actually do it and there's a there's a passion and almost like a I, I really, I think it's really cringy and disgusting to use the term family to describe a team, but there's really no better way to do it. <laughs> um, and when you're in a context of applied science, you really do have to think of it in like a filial context. Honestly, like there's not much more I can add to that. I think Dan like hit all the major points that I would also hit. I think personally, I where I am in my leadership journey journey is kind of like struggling um, with like control and providing vision. Because I think like last summer when we were both wet lab leads, it was more about like the task delegation, I didn't find very difficult because I had a very clear idea of like what needed to be accomplished. And I think like Dan and I like worked really well together on that. Um, but that was like one small sector of the project. And like Amy did a really good job of being responsible for the integration and like, oh, how does like dry lab actually talk to wet lab and wet lab talk to policy and practices and vice versa. Um, so that was just something that we had to think about at R&D meetings, but it didn't permeate everything that we did. Whereas like now I'm finding like you're, you're again in moving up the hierarchy, so to speak, you're, you have to, you have to keep this much larger image of what's going on in your head at all times. And I'm finding difficulty sort of like zooming in and out. I think, um, and like working at those different levels. Because on one hand, you have to be aware of the details of kind of what's happening in each sub team, but you also need to provide like strong enough vision for everyone to kind of like strive toward that common goal. Um, so I think like the things that I personally want to work on for the next bit is A, like time management and like organization and delegation of tasks. Like, I don't know, April has been an interesting month, but I don't know, it's, it's an exciting challenge. Like I do like, I, I do think iGEM has like given such interesting like arcs in all of our personal journeys and like I definitely would be a different person like had I not offered been offered these sort of leadership opportunities. It's so funny how Victoria touched on time management because it's it's often confusing and frustrating um, to just constantly be reminded of the fact that iGEM is a volunteer position because I think if both of us, and not necessarily not because we're looking to make a quick buck off of iGEM, but if even if even if the experience was more of a commodity, because I think because people don't understand what iGEM really is at an international or university level, when people see it on my resume, um, they discount my wet lab work from last summer as not real science because I wasn't working in a real lab or they kind of just push it in with all other lab work and said, oh, okay, he did molecular cloning, he did buffer preparation. But um, I think not a lot of people recognize, and because we do, because IDEM's not a huge name in Ontario right now, people don't realize that 
those four letters hold an enormous amount of prestige for a first and second year student. Like to, to be able to be part of an R&D design project of this caliber after just one year of university biology is really, really remarkable. And I feel like if people recognize that more then people would be willing to pour more temporally into iGEM, I would be pulling, pulling 50 hour weeks in iGEM if, if people realized that it was um, equally as prestigious, if not more advantageous in certain situations than another summer research position. Yeah, I'm gonna say like one of the things is like because you are on your own as an iGEM member, um, you have to you have to apply yourself so much more. And that's something that like I also with Dan like struggled a lot um, because like my my experience in 2017 with iGEM was not really recognized as like legitimate science experience and same with the project uh, this summer as well. And I think that again that goes back to the this tension that we've been talking about with the way the university views it and whatnot. But at the end of the day, like you're becoming a much more well-rounded scientist in iGEM, I think, because you you see a project from the beginning to end and you have to ask yourself like how to achieve this. Whereas when you're working in a laboratory as an undergraduate, you're really just given a set of tasks and told to complete them, but you're never really encouraged to think for yourself. And yeah, I think that not even a project like, is just like make this bottle and you don't know what it's gonna be used for, but thanks. <laughs> yeah, basically. It's like you're you're kind of like I guess, yeah, that's the sort of other interesting thing is that like whenever you, at these higher levels of leadership in iGEM, you're responsible for that vision the same way a PI is for their laboratory. Whereas like when you're a student in, in someone else's lab, you're often not told what that big level vision is or even like where you are in the field or why what you're working on is meaningful. It's just like a set of tasks to learn research skills. But like so much of so much of being a good scientist, I think, is being able to see where the gaps are in the literature and how you can address those with your skills. So, like, I think that if other departments really recognized how iGEM does that, I think it would be regarded as a much more like meaningful experience, or I hope it would be at least. I think Summer uh, research is very much like a biosafety level one recipe following for the most part, <laughs> because <laughs> if you can make cookies, you can make a buffer. <laughs> So it's funny that you you have to be forced into more of a problem solving capacity. Side note, cookies are hard to make, okay? When you make rocks, it's not fun because you have to throw everything out. So it's difficult. I'm not a good baker. <laughs> Amy, you can dissolve it in milk. Yeah, but it doesn't taste that good. And I'm like partially lactose and I don't really drink milk. Like there's so many other problems, but anyways. <laughs> well, um, oh no, what was it just about to mention? Oh no. Oh no! <laughs> <laughs> was it Kate? What did? What point do we finish off at? Uh, talking about this is a great way to have an intro. See, this is why this is an intro podcast interview. Whatever, it's gonna be awesome. It's funny this as is, heck. This is like you were saying, mistake. people need to take IJ more seriously. Oh, yes, okay, okay. I remember, I remember. I remember now. So, okay, <laughs> one of the reasons I think that IJ is taken less seriously by the general scientific engineering community as well sometimes. It's because the iGEM design competition is revolved around metal criteria for the most part. You want to fulfill these metal criteria, right? But the, the, what I think it should be evolving to is to be re revolved around one of two things. One is a publication. So something that's, yeah, that you can publish for the scientific community to benefit from. And that kind of does serve more fundamental purposes. And the other one is either patents or startups being more entrepreneurial, it's one of these two, because if you focus on the patents and the, and the entrepreneurial aspect, that's more applied science. So the iGEM team at that point has to kind of ask itself, are we a team that's gonna focus on the fundamental applications of this? Sorry, not even application, the fundamental aspects of this, which will lead to a publication, or are we gonna focus on the applied aspects and getting it to a, like a minimal viable product, something you can actually create a business canvas model on, something you can create a startup with, right? I think this is the next evolution of iGEM because as we've alluded to this entire conversation, iGEM is a situative learning experience. It's an experience where you learn by being in the position of a scientist as an engineer as some position, right? Now, the next question to ask yourself, and I think in these teams is, you know, branching away from just iGEM, if you're on a design team, are you going to try to create a deliverable that's a publication or a patent? It's one of these two things. I think by achieving these deliverables, people will come to see iGEM or this, these kind of design teams as something that's, you know, more legit 
um, even though like the scientists and engineers and mathematicians we're producing from iGEM, you know, they are legit. These are really smart students who are now better at interdisciplinary collaborative thinking, but they don't have deliverables that can back that up with, which is publications and patents or whatever. Um, yeah, I don't know what you guys think about that. Sorry, do you want to go, Dan, or me? Go ahead. I feel like we're going to say similar things. Oh, <laughs> um, I guess I'm, I definitely I agree with you, Patrick. I think that the internal standards of the iGEM community are one of the reasons that it lacks legitimacy um, from a university standpoint. Because like, I think a lot of times, like, um, one of the things that's really emphasized in our undergraduate training is like the importance of controls and like how how do you know that your knowledge is legitimate whereas like that's not something that's actually reflected in the igem um like standards and criteria it's just like did you do this thing but whenever you're generating any sort of knowledge or like advancement or whatever you have to ask yourself like what degree of certainty do you have that you've actually generated that thing so i think that there needs to be yeah, some sort of additional focus. And I guess that's what a publication would be good for because it's obviously you have this peer review process of like, um, how, are you, did you actually do the thing that you claim that you said you did? Um, so I, I guess just to bring it back is like, yes, I think that the focusing on these internal standards is one way of regulating the competition, but I think that iGEM never really was a competition or else we would actually have some like meaningful deliverable <laughs> not deliverable but like meaningful prize at the end of it <laughs> whereas like it, it's it's framed in a sufficiently ambiguous way that you can kind of like winning is not really a like getting gold medal standard is not clear whereas i think that if you if your goals are more concrete like you have to produce this real world thing this patent this like almost ready product or you have to produce this like product for the scientific community then i think yeah there there would be better more legitimate Anyway, sorry, I rambled. Go ahead, Dan. No, I, I think that's very cool, and I was going to say something very similar. It's, it's funny how um, it once again ties into your institution, because U of T is very much a, an institution that is wanting their undergraduate, graduate students, and professors to pump out paper after paper after paper. And because iGEM, iGEM teams do often yield publications at the end of their, or not often, but occasionally yield publications at the end of their project. Um, that doesn't necessarily mean that iGEM is recognized as a, as a program that, that creates publications. Um, it was interesting, Victoria and I went to the University of Waterloo for a, uh, it was called the Hack the Plastics uh, Biohackathon. Um, and it was so interesting because last year our iGEM project um, was focusing on essentially tackling the plastic pollution problem with the microbial solution and we're continuing the project this way so we kind of went to um, in a sense obtain new perspectives but also to kind of beta test a couple of ideas against a panel of industry professionals rather than just fundamental biologists um, is this like this is a pg podcast it's uh, a okay, so, yes. <laughs> okay, in a sense, we had our asses handed to us because <laughs> Waterloo is applied science. Like their their entire university is geared towards startup culture and and making marketable science. Whereas U of T has taught us just to have cool ideas that we can, you know, put on a publication server, and then maybe twenty years from now, our idea will lead to another idea, which leads to the other idea, which changes the world. But that's not that's not really the mind frame that the University of Toronto instills in its students. Um, so we had, we had a couple of, I'm, I'm not patting myself on the back, but we had a couple of advanced ideas compared to the average U Waterloo student, just because we have a lot more experience from our iGEM project, but they don't teach you at U of T how to market your idea, how to sell your idea, how to make it into something tangible and marketable. Um, and iGEM is actually held at a higher prestige. Maybe they're not necessarily reflected in their funding, but to a, to a university Waterloo student, being a part of the iGEM team is much, much more important and more conducive to their careers than somebody who wants to spend the entirety of their education at the University of Toronto. Yeah, I would, uh, with my bias, I would agree with that just because I come from 
the University of Waterloo. Do you think it's something that uh, you know UFT students or any IGEM student would benefit from, like a, like a lecture or a workshop on entrepreneurship? I think we we shouldn't we shouldn't necessarily be forced to, but there should be um, opportunities in in lower years to take biotechnology courses at conceptual level because i think if i if i had not been a part of igem uh, at the end of my undergraduate career i would have not even known what biotechnology really is so just to introduce to students that hey it's not necessarily about the accumulation of knowledge which in itself is inherently beneficial but it can also be about real life marketable science would be super super interesting because i think it would really transform the culture at the university and once the culture is being transformed then the curriculum is transformed and then the opportunities are transformed and i think it would be really really cool to see more of a, an opportunity for startup incubation at u of t at a biological level rather than merely at like a, an engineering level one thing that i just want to add to that is the thing that's unique about iGEM is a systemic context for any of these sort of innovations. Because like one of the things that I found sort of like frustrating, I guess, about the Waterloo Hack the Plastics uh, conference hackathon, whatever it technically was, is that there was no human practices at all. Like, so people were proposing, for example, the winning idea was literally a bioreactor in the middle of the park. Um, so you just have this giant, like, I don't know, you have like a, a trash can, I guess, of bacteria that are eating <laughs> your PET, um, which if there was any sort of like social insight would have realized that like, A, like that is impossible for biosafety standards and biosecurity standards, um, as well as all these myriad other reasons that sort of like implement or prevent its implementation. So I think that in conjunction with the University of Toronto that we should be offering more of these classes that are geared towards producing marketable science. I think that one of the things that iGEM leverages over just that applied science perspective is that you're considering how these innovations like fit into the context of a world and like asking these questions like, oh, is this actually something we should be creating? And like, if, if this is like affecting certain groups disproportionately, how can we reach out to them? How can we communicate to them? How can we ensure that the science that we're doing is responsible? So we are at the one hour point. We have one more question we wanted to ask you to. Um, and so in doing all this iGEM stuff, you guys have been extremely more busy than the average undergraduate student because this is basically a part-time job plus, you know? Um, and so one of the things we're curious about is this concept of solitude, this concept of being able to kind of like, like chill things out so that you have time for yourself. You know, how do you find time for solitude in, in all this busyness? You don't. Well, we have the advantage of forced confinement right now, at least. <laughs> I mean, from aside from like now when you're currently at, forced to be at home because you're going to get fined if you don't. Um, you know, we are all very, very busy students, but in, somehow we're all able to still be okay. We're still able to sleep. We're still able to eat. We're not dying. So where like how do you guys go about organizing yourselves in such a way or even setting up your own schedules like what do you guys do to be human aside from being students and presidents and and uh, researchers and etc i have the advantage of being extremely extroverted thankfully i think victoria does as well um but when it comes, I guess when it comes to unwinding and solitude and just taking care of yourself as a human being, it's important for me to be very, very intentional with my time. And that when I get home, if, I, if I'm spending three hours watching TV and YouTube videos and hanging out, then that's because I want to be doing that. Um, and that it's an actual legitimate benefit to what is like to the the stresses that are brought on by everyday work and how iGEM is compounding that whatnot um so, I'm sorry your girlfriend's cute tell her we say hi <laughs> anyway so what I was saying was that um it's it's really really important to 
to take time as an undergraduate because I feel like in a university context, it's almost fetishized to burn out. Um, we, we are living in a university culture where people brag about drinking energy drinks at 3 a.m. and brag about pulling all-nighters and brag about studying for 15 hours a night or whatnot. So if you want to avoid doing that because it's a legitimate physical and mental health risk to be living a lifestyle like that, it's, it's kind of important to separate yourself from that almost self-harm culture. Um, and and to maintain some semblance of intentionality not only with your work life but with your personal life you have to take an entire day off and then work a little harder the next day like do it <laughs> that's i've never been one to to i mean I, I inevitably burn out no matter what that's what happens when you're working a 50-hour schedule but um <laughs> it's it's important to try to minimize that damage. I uncovered it all. <laughs> okay, that's great. All right, so this kind of is gonna this wraps up the uh, our podcast slash conversation, whatever this is going to be. Uh, we will see. Um, Dan, Vic, I really appreciate you guys uh, giving us your time. Um, and this kind of sums it up. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>